New exhibits on display throughout July and August, and a look at one of the largest historical artifacts in the area. That's coming up right now on this episode of Museum Moments, your window on the museum scene here in Museum City, Portsmouth. <music> Welcome to this July-August 2016 episode of Museum Moments. I'm your host, Rob Lauer. We're going to start today's show with another segment of Hands-On History, but the historical artifact we're going to look at is one that's way too big to be handled. I'm joined by Emily Kilgore, who is the assistant curator of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard Museum. Thanks for joining us, Thank Emily. Thank you. Now, Emily usually shows up for what we call our hands-on history segments, where she brings some of the things in the archives of the museum, we can lay our hands on them, and she explains us uh, a little bit about them. Today, we're going to look at the biggest artifact that they have, and that is the lightship Portsmouth. She's very huge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, tell us a little bit about her. Yeah, so uh, lightships were considered floating lighthouses. Um, it's not something that a lot of people really think about. She Obviously, she has a very large light on her at the top. And lightships were designed to be stationed in the middle of a water area where you couldn't get a lighthouse to work. Um, so Portsmouth right here, she is named thus because she's finished her, her duty here in Portsmouth. Never actually served here, but all light ships had a name painted on the side of them based on where they were located. Okay. So this light ship here, she actually served up at Cape Charles as the Charles. She also served as the Chesapeake and as the Stone Horse. So she had three different names. Um, came into service in 1916, so she's 100 years old this year. Wow. I think she looks very good for 100. She's she in does. very good condition. <laughs> Um, she needs a little bit of a paint job, but you know, living on the water, that often happens with ships in general. Who at 100 anyway. years old could Exactly, use a he needs a little makeup every now and again. <laughs> um, so she right here, she uh, served until the 1960s, became a museum ship owned by the Coast Guard, until the city took her over and uh, they turned her into the ship that the city now owns today. So she's, she's our museum here. She's actually in conjunction with the Naval Shipyard Museum. And we have her here open, uh, free by admission, or free by donation, sorry. Free by donation while the Naval Shipyard Museum is undergoing renovations. And when the Naval Museum is open, that this is part yes, of the price Yes, this is part of it. Tip. Yes, it's a combo ticket. Um, the light ship is open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So during those times, it would be a combination ticket between the two museums. All right, so now you're going to take us on board. Yes, and we're show going to us. walk through, and I'm going to show you guys all the cool stuff. All right, well, let's get going. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So what's this? <laughs> this over here is what we call the mushroom anchor. And a lot of ships only have one anchor, maybe two as a backup. But light ships, since their job was to stay in the same place at all times, they had to put a second anchor down to be able to keep it actually stationed in the right area in all kinds of awful weather. So it was not an easy job. Wow. How long would they say put in one area? A lot of times their uh, time in a certain area was six months or all, all the way up to nine months. So think about like a classic military cruise nowadays. Six to nine months would be how long they would be staying there. Wow. Yeah, that it's sounds... a little too long for me. <laughs> yeah. A little too long for me. So shall we head inside? Yeah, let's head inside. Okay. So welcome to the inside of the light ship. Um, she's not very big, uh, so we're gonna walk around and I'll show you guys some of her finer points. Right. All right, so the first thing I want you guys to look at is, I'm gonna hand this to you, and I'm not sure how we'll get that, but <laughs> when, you, when you look up, you'll actually see that it's completely hollow. There is a series of, um, it's a ladder going all the way up to the top, and this would have been called, this is called the hollow mast. So this is where, when the uh, Coast Guardsmen were having to work on the, the station and have to put new oil in the light, they would climb all the way up here. So it was actually a lot safer than having to do a typical, um, a, a different type of light ship because they would have had to climb on the outside. So if the ship is rocking and rolling and turning like it would have been if it was you know, in a bad storm, it would not have been very safe. So it's very safe for them to climb up all the way to the top, as safe as climbing up a ladder can be. So um, I think it's a little scary, but what the guys would do is they would uh, put the gas bag on their belt and they would put the um, hose in their mouth and they would climb all the way up to the top, fill up the gas, put it back in their mouth and climb all the way back down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll continue on. 
into the galley, which is a fancy maritime term for the kitchen. So we've got the kitchen here. All, everything is original minus the, the food that we put out as a way to interpret what a kitchen would have looked like. We do have the original stove here. Wow. Now, um, <laughs> It's, it's a little impressive. Now, working on the stove would have been a little difficult, much with the rocking and the rolling of the ship, uh, because you're having to try to keep the pots and the pans on the burners without causing any sort of fires or anything like that. Um, now, one of the most common things that the sailors would eat would be scouse and duff, which doesn't that sound appealing. What is that? Scouse, uh, would have, it was anything that was any part of meat thrown together with potatoes and any sort of trimmings that they could possibly get. The sailors had rations brought out to them, so if the rations started to get a little scarce because the weather was too bad, scouse and duff was the common food of a late ship sailor. That sounds like something you would eat like a Charles Dickens it, Exactly, exactly. It sounds like a great poor man's food, but um, the, the sailors would have eaten it and it was officers and crew members alike, so it didn't matter what your rank was, you still had some scouse and duff. Mm. So think about that the next time you get stuck eating a PB&J sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll continue on. We're going to go past the engine room area into the section of the ship known as the officer's quarters. So we have an engineer's cabin. There would also be an NCO quarters. Um, we'll kind of look around in each of them. You'll notice that they're a lot larger than uh, the cruise quarters that we'll look at here in a moment. And that's just because if you were an officer, you got a little better, mm -hmm. you know, in your own room, your nice bed, um, kind of your own space, curtains to shut, doors to shut. Um, you got your own head which is the fancy maritime term for a bathroom. Um, so it had a great shower in it, a, a toilet, and all of the piping that's involved in all of that. So um, we can walk up there if you would like. Sure. All right, so we'll walk up there, take a look, step over some grates. So we have all the original stuff hanging out there. It's a little tight back here, but still, impressive to have its own space. Uh, the officers also were not in charge of having to clean their own head most of the time. <laughs> they make the crew do it. Which we do have a crew shower and a crew restroom that I'll show you guys the shower here in a moment. Now inside the ship, there would have been an alarm horn and this alarm horn was ridiculously loud and it was designed to when a um, ship was coming close, the signalmen up above would go in and set off the alarm so everybody knew to get to their stations. Um, we've never had any major incidents on this light ship, but the most well-known accident was when the Olympic, the sister ship to the Titanic, actually wrecked um, against the Nantucket, the light ship Nantucket, and everybody on the crew perished. Um, so we never had any instances like that, but you know, wrecks could occur in nasty foggy weather. Um, we have a small officer crew area right here, bunk beds, so your lower officers would have stayed there. And I'll open that. We do have a small office space right in here um, where a typewriter would have been located and the signal men would, um, you could type letters home, you could listen to the radio. Um, we do have the signal space upstairs, but signal men could work in a smaller space in down here. Um, my favorite thing right here is this random little table. This would have been where the officers not would have eaten, but they would have done all of their meetings, any sort of planning. They play cards here. Um, all of the eating would not happen this close to the galley because with a stove that big, the galley's very hot. So um, we'll continue on past the sick bay locker, which is always a lot of fun. We've set up um, some stuff that would have been typical in the 60s and the 70s on, on, on a ship, despite that the ship went out of service in the 60s. And right here is my favorite of the quarters. It's the captain's quarters, so it's the largest area. Um, the captain could also be called the skipper. Um, so if, if you were the skipper, you kind of had your own space, your own beautiful closet, and your own sink, which was considered high class. Now as we leave the officer's area, we're going to head up to the crew area as well as where all of the working system are, like the fire extinguishing system. 
We do have a modern table here that we set up uh, programming and games when the light ship has special programs going on. Um, this month we're focusing on what the sailors would have done for fun. Light ship revelry is what we call it. And so they could play dice, play dominoes, a lot of card games occurred, anything to pass the time because these men were on this ship for six to nine months and you were sitting out in the middle of the water, it gets pretty dull. So they made up a lot of card games and they played in traditional maritime fair, they, they played a lot of card games and a lot of dice. A lot of gambling occurred on the ship. I'm sure. So right here we have our cruise quarters, six bunks, they look a little tight. Um, we often ask people would they rather spend time on the top bunk or the bottom bunk and what would you say? Probably top. The top bunk. Now, if you were on a light ship and it's rocking and rolling, guess Probably who falls the, the furthest? One. Yeah, the middle bunk was the one that people fought for the most. Um, the mattresses are not original to the ship. They would have been a lot thinner, think more like an army cot style, so very, very thin. Um, a lot of ships had ropes that way they could tie themselves into, um, kind of like a barrier, but bunk beds were a very hotly contested um, you know, commodity around here. So we'll continue on up to the engine room space, which is my favorite room in the entire light ship uh, because of the steam powered windlass. Now the steam powered windlass would have used, uh, was used to not do the engine so much, but to work with the anchors. We have both of these anchors here. The mushroom anchor you saw outside is the black chain. The red chain would have been the normal anchor. Um, steam powered windlasses were used because the anchors were so heavy that they were not able to get you know, the, 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 the anchors down themselves. So they would use the, the water, which would turn it into steam power, be able to crank it really well. The water did have to come in on rations from shore because you had, um, you know, we can't use salt water because as water tends to um, evaporate, it leaves the salt behind. So with this engine room, because we have the cruise area now, the cruise lavatory would have been right here. And, uh, you know, two people, or two two sinks here but this is the crew would have been you know six people seven people um, not like officers so everybody had to fight for that we also have the head right here um, and then the crew shower which is a very large shower and the reason for that is is that more people could try to fight for the showers and get them in and out as quickly as possible so that's the that's the front part of our, our engine room space. To finish it out, we do have the pantry. Um, and it was formally the pantry, as well as, um, you know, we've turned it back into that so you can kind of see what it looks like on the inside. This would have been typical. And the reason why the pantry is here and not near the galley is because if rats were on the ship, um, you wouldn't want rats near your dried goods, your stored goods, and rats tended to stay in spaces where it was warm. So they would have been hanging out in the galley where the cooked food would have been. So this would have been blocked off, completely um, set away from it, and it just was a, a place to keep it safe. So as we finish out, the door that we came in is actually the original refrigerator. So that is um, partially why it's so cold in here. I'm <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so we have the refrigerator that would have been right there, but we like to show everybody what a Fresnel lens would have looked like. So Rob, if you want to flip that switch behind you there. So this is a Fresnel lens. This is not one that would have been on top of the ship. This actually came from a, a lighthouse uh, somewhere in the eastern part of Virginia. And it is here to demonstrate how the, the light uh, refraction and reflection worked. I love this Fresnel lens because it's all glass panels. A lot of the lenses created now are either plastic or plexiglass. And this one was all handmade and we've taken out a couple of pieces so you can see what it would look like on the inside. So it's a lot of fun. This is the light ship. Great, so you want to show us up? Yes, we're going to head upstairs and go see an area that we don't normally get to take visitors to. All right, let's go. All right. So this is an area that people don't usually get to go to. Um, this is the uh, top side bow of the ship. 
So we have uh, what would be just kind of the first part of a crane, as well as what is called a jack staff, which is named thus because on old ships, that is where the Union Jack used to fly. On this one, that is where the American flag would have flown or even a Coast Guard flag during its service into um, you know, working with, with the, the light ship itself. Um, so we've got the mushroom anchor hanging out over here again, so we get to see the top part of that. And um, up here is an outer area of the ship where you would see the uh, original bell that says U.S. Life Saving Service on it, as well as the um, outside uh, uh, steering wheel, the ship's wheel, that you could work both inside and outside on that. So we're gonna continue on to the other side of the ship where we have our lifeboats. At one point in time, this would have been open to the general public. Um, however, we don't deem it as safe as it used to be. So, um, so we've got original lifeboats here. The canvas covers we do have to replace every couple of years. Uh, the light ships would commonly have two lifeboats, so there's one on each side of the ship. And uh, behind me is the area where the American flag would have flown as well. And we do have the original life rings. Oddly enough, they're orange and plastic looking. <laughs> they would have uh, been here. There's quite a few of them stationed throughout the ship. How many would fit in the lifeboats? Um, usually the entire crew, um, 12 men were assigned to the light ship at all times. Um, maybe up to nine would be on board at any given time, but they did have enough to be able to sustain. I'd say each boat could fit, it's an average lifeboat, so about 30 people could fit in here snugly, but they obviously they wouldn't need that many for a crew of only 12. So since it was a uh, lighthouse on a ship, we do have the, the lens up there that would have gone anywhere from two to eight miles, depending on the size. Our light ship does not have a very large lens on top of it, and it would have to be changed by men climbing in the hollow mass, which we just saw inside. Uh, so up there is a light. It doesn't work currently, uh, but we can, we can put a new bulb in it and get it changed and make it look good. Emily, thanks so much for taking the Thank time you. to show us not only the inside of the ship, yeah. but also the top here that it's, it's fun. visitors don't get to see. No, no, this is a now really wonderful part. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thanks so much. Thank and we you. look forward to coming back again yes, for another hands-on history episode. All right, see you then. The newest city of Portsmouth Museum is the Portsmouth Community Library Museum, located on Elm Avenue, just one block off of High Street. And here is Naval Shipyard Museum curator Diane Cripps to tell us about a new exhibit on display there. Well, Diane, thanks for having us back here. My pleasure. Now, I've noticed that uh, things look very different here in the Library Museum. So tell us about some of the changes. Well, we've done, a, we've done a refresh on the exhibit that's currently installed now. It just opened last week at the end of June. And it tells the story of how the community library was founded and traces its history through its 18-year existence serving African Americans with library services here in Portsmouth. So what's a little bit of the history can you tell us? Well, the, what we're hoping is that when visitors come, they'll kind of feel what it was like to come back to mid-20th century Portsmouth when segregation was the law of the land and to have people think about what that was like when African Americans couldn't take advantage of various services in town or had to use a specific entrance in different stores mm. or weren't allowed basically to take advantage of some services like library services. Did, originally there was a library at St. James Episcopal Church? That was the earliest kind of library slash reading room mm -hmm. that um, African American leaders in town got together and established and that was way back in the 1920s and it took until uh, the World War II era to actually, uh, for that same group to kind of evolve and work with city officials to establish this library. Where was this originally situated? I know the building has been moved here to Elm Avenue. But... Right, it was over at Effingham and North Street. Okay. It's actually been moved twice. When the library closed because there was integration in mm. the mid 60s, it was moved to a church parking lot not far from where it was originally built. And then in 2007, I believe, is when it was moved here and restored and and the African American Historical Society here in town had a lot to do with that. So this side of the library is going to be the history of the library. Correct. Now there's a new exhibit coming 
for the other half right. of the library? We're That's still working works. on some of the um, some of the research involved in that. It's about the black business district here in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of which is gone now. There are a few remaining buildings, but um, after that era when there was integration, things like the construction of the um, the interstates and malls farther out from mm -hmm. shopping districts and the car culture kind of put an end to that. In fact, just last week we we made some more contacts to help us tell some more of those stories about the black owned businesses like barbershops, the Norfolk Journal and Guide had mm -hmm. an office in Portsmouth and that kind of thing. So we're hoping to, um, right down to the last minute, weave some of the stories in that we're getting from people who still remember that mm -hmm. or who are related to some of the business owners from back then. Where was the, the black business district? It was basically in the same neighborhood as the um, library was mm -hmm. along Effingham Street, North Street. In fact, um, the library's librarian um, that we have a, an exhibit about, Bertha Edwards, was quoted as saying, we were on the main drag, meaning the library was right in, kind of in the center of mm -hmm. the churches, the businesses, and the library, and it was kind of a, a daily thing for people to come and visit the library there. You know, knowing something a little bit about the history of Portsmouth, and knowing how small Portsmouth was at that time, it sort of boggles the mind that there were actually just in the space of a few blocks, that type of segregation. But it was, it was the everyday experience of both whites and blacks at that time. It was just kind of in people's minds that yeah. there were businesses and services for either race, but not necessarily both. But one of the interesting things about the community library was that it was open to all. Anyone could come in here. Now, it was mostly patronized by African Americans, but it was open to anybody who wanted to come in. The museum, is it open? Are there set hours? Uh, can groups or individuals call a number if it to set up a visit, or mm -hmm. how does it work? We have both. We have public hours on the weekends. Fridays and Saturdays, we're going to be open noon to 5, and admission is free. And we will also take groups um, of between 8 to 15 people by appointment. Mm -hmm. And people can call the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard Museum, where our history offices are, at 393-8591 if they want to set up an appointment. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and telling us what's happening here. My pleasure. Thanks. The Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center on the corner of High Street and Court Street has new exhibits on display and special events taking place throughout the months of July and August. And here's the center's curator, Gail Paul, with more information. I'm joined by Gail Paul, who's the curator of the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. Thanks for joining us, Gail. Thank you. Good to see you. So looking ahead at July and August, what do you have happening here? Well, we have a new exhibit that's opening, um, Transition States of War, David Keith and Combat Papers. Um, that exhibition fe features primarily the work by David Keefe. He's an artist and he is also um, a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. Um, he served in Iraq from 2002 to 2009 and he was in combat from 2006 to 2007. So a lot of his paintings focus on the war experience, but also he merges back and forth into his childhood. So there's this kind of surreal quality about his work. He also founded Combat Papers New Jersey. And that's a part of a larger organization, Combat Papers, hmm. um, that was established to transition, help um, soldiers transition from military service back into civilian life. Okay. And so we'll also offer um, a workshop in conjunction with David Keith. He'll come and set up a workshop here. Okay, now what, tell us a little bit about the workshop. What is that? Is that for people who have, have served? served? We're setting up a project that will happen in September, and we're looking for veterans right now to participate in the workshop. Um, with the combat papers, um, essentially they take uniforms, but they turn them into paper pulp, so it's kind of like they transition from one experience into another. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to cut up their military uniforms, but that's just a part of the project, mm -hmm. um, and it is the basis for what, it, what begins the dialogue, to open up the dialogue. And that will conclude with an exhibition um, that week, final week of September, um, and they'll, they'll give a talk. So the exhibition will be on October 1st in our art annex, and they'll also give a talk to also share stories about their experience. Okay, so if someone is watching this and they're a veteran and they're interested in participating, what do they do? They can get in touch with me here at the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. Um, they can give me a call 757-393-8543. Um, they can also look us up on um, the web, web page. We have a web page they can visit and okay. contact me there. In July, we'll still have um, Portrait as Narrative. Mm -hmm. That features six Hampton Roads artists um, from the region, some that are currently living here and then some that have moved away. And so that's a pretty very dynamic exhibit that um, features a variety of work from painting, 
metal point, um, printmaking. So that's here in July and then in August? And August we'll have another exhibition. It'll feature, it's called Out and About, and it'll feature the Tidewater Artists Association. So it'll be selected um, series of work from that um, organization. Meanwhile, First Fridays, first weekends, it's always free here. It's free and open to the public from 5 till 8. Okay, and that includes music, concert in the courtyard, yes. refreshments, drink, and all that? And, and opening receptions, usually. So. Okay, and then Saturdays are all, first Saturdays are always free. Yes. Gail, I understand that there have been some improvements to the grounds here at the courthouse. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came to be? Well, um, it's been a few years. We've been kind of working on this project um, to try and get something planted in that parking strip between the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center and the um, parking lot. Uh, there's this long strip of land and uh, William Smoot came to me a few years ago and we started planning something and we just were approved to put in a pollinator garden. So on Thursday or Wednesday they showed up um, and with a whole bunch of plants and <laughs> Thursday started planting and today it's in. Now Gail, I know I understand that there is a new event, a new event happening every month here that is somehow related to the farmer's market and having to do with food and all that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we've started having tasting. So the third Saturday of every month from 10 to 2, I mean, excuse me, 10 to 12, um, the farmer's market is the sponsor for it. Um, they'll be setting up um, tastings in the courtyard. So they'll be bringing in guest chefs and they'll prepare unusual fruits and vegetables so you can get to sample them and taste them uh -huh. and know how to prepare them for yourselves and your families. Well, there you have it. So come on out to the Port of the Art and Cultural Center. They always have exhibits going on throughout the year. And of course, always on the first Friday of every month, there's concerts in the courtyard. It's a great time, a great way to meet your neighbors, taste some great food, see some great art, and just take in the sights and sounds of Old Town. Thanks for joining us, Gail. Thank you, Rob. Good to see you again. Good to see you. That's it for our show today. For more information on what's taking place at all the museums in Portsmouth, log on to www.portsvaevents.com. I'm Rob Lauer. Join me again in September and October for another episode of Museum Moments.